Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this um, next in the series of knowledge webinars from the IFM. Um, I, I'm just going to carry on welcoming you. I can see that people are joining as I speak, so welcome to you all. Um, if I can just go through the system for how to ask questions, um, which we will take at the end of the webinar. Uh, can you use the questions function on your dashboard? The other thing I would like to tell you is that this webinar is being recorded. Okay. Welcome, I'm going to start. Um, my name's Annie Horsley. I'm Research and Information Executive at BIFM. Um, and as being a Research and Information Executive, we're responsible, my team is responsible for the first class research and insight within BIFM. We support FMs with our, our knowledge and information series, and we develop content ongoing this is something that we do continuously throughout the year. If we just have a look now at, at some of the, the knowledge and information that is available, and you'll see at the front there, um, the actual content for this webinar today is based around the Selecting FM Software GPG which is one of the newest GPGs that we have available via the website. We do have other um, guides and insight available. Um, and again, just access through the research section of the BIFM website. Okay, if we get started today then, the speakers for today, um, are very kindly <laughs> supplied by the, the authors of the Selecting FM Software GPG. So if I can welcome Mike Grizzly, Commercial Director at SWG, Penny Brinsley, Consultant at SWG, and we also have Edward Payne, Head of Operational Estates at Luton and Dunstable Hospital NHS Trust. And just to give you a bit of background on the speakers before I hand over to Mike, Mike's role at Service Works Group is to provide direction and leadership to the organization's ongoing strategy for developing customer acquisition and long-term customer retention. Mike's experience includes 30 years financial, commercial, strategic, ERP systems and service management. Penny is responsible for managing key UK-based clients. She has over 14 years experience with the FM solutions market and has excellent product and market experience from working direct with clients. Penny is an experienced implementation and product specialist who has significant product expertise. And now for Edward. Edward's the head of operational estates for the Estates and Facilities Division at Luton and Dunstable NHS Trust. He has a wealth of experience working within the NHS and private healthcare water systems, medical gases, electrical and other specialist systems. Edward monitors all work carried out by contractors and has implemented multiple systems to ensure compliance with relevant standards. He also carries out training to staff on new systems and regulatory requirements and provides guidance for systems and processes. So now I'd, I'd like to hand over to Mike um, to get started with today's presentations. Thank you very much, Annie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Annie said, my name is Mike Risley. I'm the commercial director here at SWG, that service works group. Uh, and I guess the reason I'm doing this is that over my career, I've been responsible for literally hundreds of complex business system implementations, which include CAFM, service management, ERP procurement, and, and others. Um, Service Works Group, for those of you who aren't aware, are one of the leading providers of CAPM solutions worldwide. 
and we've got vast experience in successful implementation of these products. And uh, also, just in case you're not aware, our primary product, um, our Catherine product, is called QFM. And just moving on to the agenda now, uh, I won't read out all the bullet points here, but um, we'll draw as we run through this agenda on some key highlights from the Good Practice Guide and provide some useful information on successfully selecting and implementing an FM system. Okay, so uh, after that intro, we'll, I'll hand over to Penny, who will kick off the detail. Thank you, Mike. Um, the industry is full of acronyms. In the UK, the most commonly used term for facilities management is CAFM, which stands for Computer Aided Facilities Management Software. But you may also often hear other acronyms such as FMS, CMMS, or even MMS, all of which to a certain extent offer a similar functionality, although their origins may stem from different backgrounds or industries. The image on the slide shows the results of a ServiceWorks poll regarding the most frequently used technology, um, sorry, terminology that you see. Um, and as you can see, CAFM software is the most widely used term with 40% of the votes in both 2016 and 15, closely followed by FM software at 35%. This next slide outlines the various FM functionality and facilities management software generally covers the following. The monitoring, management and planning of operational activities. It also covers expenditure as well as compliance, capital budgeting across your estate or portfolio. FM software functionality typically includes your FM, which is of your buildings, people, services, and importantly, resource management, including help desks. Mobile, for the time-sensitive control of your workforce. Asset management of the building, plant and equipment. Property and space for the utilisation and move management around your estate. Hot desking or flexible workspace management for recharging, administration and modelling and bookings management. So this could be for your conference rooms, visitor bookings, checking them in and out, or even car park bookings. So we're just going to run a quick poll, um, which you should see come up on your screen now. The question is, are you currently using FM software? So if you'd like to participate, you should see three options on your screen to select. We're just going to give you a few more seconds and then we'll flick to the results. Okay. So interestingly, from the results, we can see that 38% are currently using FM software, whereas we have 20% um, that are actually looking to change. And then we have 7% uh, that are not using any systems at all at the moment. I'm now going to pass you back across to Mike, who is going to talk through why um, you should implement FM software. Thank you, Penny. Sorry, excuse us, we're just juggling with the technology for a second. Okay, so um, why implement FM software? Um, I won't read out all of the bullets on the slide, um, but these items are typically the sort of issues people say they're looking for. However, the point I really want to make is that people really want to think about and be absolutely crystal clear what the actual benefits they're trying to achieve are. 
sometimes these real benefits get lost when the selection starts to focus on detailed business requirements. So fundamentally, they might include reductions in costs and administration costs and other costs, improving quality of service and quality of your premises for your staff, visitors and stakeholders, improving performance of contractors in terms of both reducing cost and providing better service across the organization, improving compliance. Now, this, this becomes particularly relevant um, in the light of an health, uh, health and safety obligations, where sometimes people can even be held personally responsible if, uh, if you have failures in this area. Another big area of interest is asset performance. Uh, and this can have a huge financial impact if you can stretch out the, uh, the, the length of life of your assets by an extra year. Maximizing resource efficiency is another major area where, you know, ideally you can just get more work done from the same resource pool. The reason for stressing the focus um, in this way is that the real benefits are often the key to whether you should invest in a new system. And just as importantly, underpin the success of your business case when you're looking for final approval. So moving on to uh, some pre-implementation pre considerations, um, you'll need to start thinking about um, the things that you need to do. So I'd say the first thing you should do is ensure that you've clearly understood and documented your business processes. Ideally, you should consider uh, what the business process people refer to as the as-is process, i.e. where you are now, and your to-be process of where you'd like to be when the system is implemented. I think in fairness, it may be quite difficult to define your to-be processes in detail until you've actually selected a system. Um, but it's definitely worth thinking about how you think the, the future is likely to look. Also, check that you understand the levels of integration required with other products across your organization, or in fact, any of your partners. Some of the typical integration points might be with your um, HR, procurement, finance, uh, BIM models, BMS system, or, or other systems also. You'll also want to consider the various methods of purchase available. Um, so, you know, you may purchase via a capital cost method where you make an outright purchase, or you may be looking to uh, an operating cost model where you pay monthly or annually. The reason for considering this quite early on is that the decision could significantly impact on your procurement process that you need to go through based on your internal rules. These are just a handful of the pre-implementation considerations, but the Good Practice Guide has an assessment checklist which will prompt you through a more, a more comprehensive list. So one thing I wanted to develop a little bit more on is, is preparing your financial case. And, and sometimes think people think this is a bit early to start talking about that. But it's an area where we see that FMs often have less experience in preparing a business case for a software project. And we often see that by the time an FM comes to purchase a new system, they've often been through the process two or three times and been blocked at the last financial sign-off stage. So I would encourage you to think about this early on. So it's important to try and get the first, to get it right first time. I'd say there are two sides to this equation. Cost, it's important to be clear about cost from the outset. You must you know, remember to factor in software license fees, any consultancy, infrastructure and hardware costs, but also think about internal time that you're going to have to invest in any project. Do also remember that uh, on the other side of that basic cost equation, that um, you might actually have some savings to make. So you maybe have reduced outlay in terms of license or uh, maintenance costs for existing software that's going to be replaced. On the benefit side, it's a little more subjective, but um, you should be considering things like um, reducing administration costs, 
improve contractor management. So typically that's reducing costs and improving their service quality, better management of compliance, Self-service can help to empower your users and most importantly, reduce admin time and pressure on an FM help desk, again, further reducing costs. And as I've already discussed, stretching the life of assets can make quite a difference as well. These are just some of the examples, but to help with this, ServiceWorks has produced uh, an ROI calculator. So this helps to take you through this uh, return on investment consideration. And it's a, a complementary or part of our complementary FM advisory pack, which help which can help you to build the business case in some detail. Um, the advisory pack that we provide supports and underpins a good practice guide, and we'll provide details at the end of uh, at the end of this session if you'd like to request the pack. So now we move on to discuss a little bit more about the vendor and product selection. Um, once you've made your financial case, or at least you've got a good idea of what the basis for your business case is going to be, you can think about vendor and product selection. You'll need to create a list of requirements so you can start to review and compare different vendors and products on a like-for-like -like basis. It shouldn't just include software functionality. Um, your requirements should consider items like vendor stability, their service delivery capabilities, your technology and IT requirements, data security issues are really important these days, um, integration with other systems if you're gonna have any, pricing, uh, vendor, vendor industry experience could be important to you as well. You know, If you're a hospital, a university, a service provider or a football club or, or whatever you may be, you may gain comfort from working with a vendor who's experienced with similar organizations. It's imperative that a formal plan is in place so that you can ensure that the stakeholders are aware of their role and responsibilities when the project milestones are met. A quality vendor should be able to guide you through this process and help you to ensure a clear project plan and show how to eliminate the most common risks. Um, I thought just to break things up we'd do a second poll now if that's okay with you guys. Um, so this is just about whether you're likely to need any third party integration. So um, if you do implement uh, or, or your existing system, do you actually integrate or are you likely to want to integrate with any third party products? So just click on the option that most suits. Hopefully everyone's clicked by now. Oh, here we are. Uh, so interestingly, at least about half of you already recognize that integration is an important factor um, with a further 30% unsure and 20% just no. So clearly integration does appear to be an important factor across the group. Thank you for that. Uh, if we could return back to the slides now, please. Right, thank you for that. I'll hand you back now to Penny, who will carry on further with the presentation. Thank you, Mike. And we're just switching the slides back. OK. <clears throat> So the Good Practice Guide provides a typical implementation plan which outlines the various stages involved in rolling out an FM system. It's really important to ensure that all parties are aware of their roles and responsibilities and that a clear project plan is set from the onset. With the diverse nature of FM software, along with the computer literacy levels of typical users, it's also really important to ensure that the correct investment is made into the training of the systems. It's worth considering how your software provider will carry out the training sessions. So could it be online, 
face to face or even perhaps consider a train the trainer program. It's absolutely critical to ensure that your organisation commits the necessary time and resources to training before and even after the system goes live. With regards to data and reporting, it was interesting that a recent survey run by ServiceWorks that it was actually 80% of respondents thought that enhanced reporting was a key benefit to FM software. With this in mind, before you set out, you may need to make sure that you clearly define your organization's reporting requirements and understand the reporting capabilities of your chosen FM software application. It's worth also considering, is your data correct and clean? And do you understand what reports are actually needed? It's really important because if you haven't defined what reports you need, you might not get the desired outcome from your system. You should also ensure that the system's reporting capability for qualitative, financial and operational information should always be easy to use and flexible enough to allow you to create your own reports. This next slide details some of the top trends um, currently within FM. What's really important to consider is the future trends. They may not actually affect you now, but they could do in the future as the FM sector becomes more and more automated. Particularly, in relevant, particularly relevant and strong in the sector is the rise of self-service and a more service-centric FM applications. The fact that a user can log a reactive maintenance request, book rooms online, make an inquiry about lost property or even book a hot desk, all helps to deliver a better service and reduce administration time. Mobile is another area that will continue to grow with the use of smartphones, apps, tablet devices and even wearable technology now. With offline capabilities, operatives can still access and input information even in areas where there is no Wi-Fi or a mobile signal. It's worth noting at this point that BIFM have launched a technology work party, which is comprised of BIFM members and other professionals in the industry, exploring the roles of technology and its impact on facilities management. The aim of which is to produce useful information and guidance to help FMs understand new solutions and practices that technology will bring. If you have any particular trends you'd like to hear more about, and we'll provide some contact details at the end of the webinar for you to Technology overview, so what technologies you might need to consider as a result of implementing an FM system. Going to tender, so the various process involved and considerations that need to be factored in. Training requirements and the considerations around location, those who would require the training and at what level. Um, so these are good topics that are covered. I'm now going to pass you across to Edward Payne, who is Head of Operational Estates at Luton Dunstable NHS Hospital. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm Edward Payne, Luton Dunstable Hospitals NHS Trust. Uh, I don't know if, you know if anybody knows Luton Dunstable Hospital, it's one of the top performing uh, trusts in the country and is, is the only hospital that actually manages to meet the A&E four hour waiting target. Um, but in the background of that is an estate that is, is very uh, old and, and uh, in very poor condition. So it's very important for us to have an FM system that can actually identify where all our issues are and to help us um, move on and uh, plan replacements of equipment, assets, etc. So the key to us was um, having the location details, proper uh, mapping of the hospital, um, assets all mapped so we knew where they are, and obviously to plan our PPM and reactive works. And then we obviously we wanted to move on to the mobile devices as mentioned, um, so because we have a couple of remote buildings as well, so that helps to manage our workforce moving around. And then the key, of course, is the reporting, so we can report on lots of different aspects, operatives, uh, the work types coming in, uh, so that guides how we move on in the future. So um, for key for us, there's two, two aspects would be the locations for our reactive works and then our asset management. 
for our PPM scheduling. So as part of our implementation, we employed a couple of people to go around and actually look for every single asset they can find, be it, the, be it as you might see on there, a lift or down to a macerator, um, fire alarm panels, nurse call systems, medical gas. And then from that, we could put up and maintenance into the system. The second element for us was making sure all our drawings are up to date and then using the geography hierarchy from that to feed into QFM uh, so that we are act accurately reporting on where all the jobs are being generated. Uh, we also had a system uh, on the site, FX Space, which we are currently integrating into QFM uh, as a space module. So that helps us by, because we are carrying out a great deal of work at Luton and we modify knock down buildings, build new bits and pieces constantly, and then by just updating our drawings, we'll automatically feed into QFM, so then our hierarchy is, uh, uh, geography hierarchy is always accurate, and then we can allocate the assets to it. That helps us planning in the future. So our main uh, thing there is our job prioritization um, for our supervisors. We currently log about a thousand jobs a month on the system um, and these can be for the portering or the waste team or the estates maintenance team and uh, the supervisor will have a screen similar to what you see there so he can see uh, the jobs that have not been allocated and so he can allocate them to a person and then he can see the ones that are red that are obviously overdue which are probably urgent jobs or amber they're coming to the you know coming to the near time that they should be due so that that helps us uh, monitor what's going out there in, in the field. <clears throat> As I said, the reporting of these jobs is, is very important. So we created a few custom reports, and um, so we can actually then, this simple one here, it actually shows who's doing all the work. Um, we don't use this as a, a stick to beat anybody up, although operative number 17 needs to buck his ideas up, I would suggest, having only done one job. But it's interesting from that report that um, operative I have it down here, one, five, and six, with the three highest, are all electricians. So that just points us into the fact that actually most of the jobs we're generating are electrically based. Um, so we, we can actually then help to, to guide us as to, do we need to employ more electricians? Because we do have a, a few vacancies, so we just need to make sure that we're recruiting the right staff to fill the gaps based on, on where the work is being created. Uh, the next reports we, we, we're carrying out on a monthly basis would be how, how we're performing on the on the jobs that are actually reported. So you see this 85% is not a bad rate. Um, so what we will do on a monthly basis is actually report on the the cancelled, the incomplete, and the the started jobs of which there are four of one, seven and nine, seven and nine, is to find out why they're incomplete, why they've been started, not completed or why they've been cancelled. The jobs that are due are obviously in progress and they will come up into a future <laughs> report. But then we would do a monthly report to actually get the detail of these particular sort of 20 or so jobs uh, to find out what the reasons are behind it. Um, our PPM performance graph that we produced uh, makes us look very bad and it shows that we are cancelling a lot of PPMs. Uh, this, there is a good reason behind this. Um, Changes in, in uh, how we would plan PPMs and who, who different people have different ideas. So at one point we loaded the system with a lot of PPMs that we would do in an ideal world. Uh, and we don't have the manpower for it, so they get cancelled and they're the lower grade jobs. Whereas now we take a view that we will only schedule the PPMs that are actually critical, mandatory, statutory requirements uh, and the the best practice or the, the, the jobs that we'd like to do on a regular basis, but we'll fit them in as when we kind of taken out of the PPM. So now we do cancel a lot less uh, of the PPM work. So it's sort of guided us on how we should be scheduling work as well on that one. So then we have, uh, we would take some, we take some reports based on uh, blockages. We, we do a report on, uh, in the summer we do a report on overheating and in the winter we do a report on uh, cold areas so we can see who's reporting it, where it's cold most of the time, where it's hot most of the time. And this particular one is, is on looking at blockages. 
uh, and Ward 33 and Maternity Ward uh, was creating the most blockages there. Now, this, this we on occasions we've looked at this and we've seen that there has been blockages in adjacent wards and areas, which points you to a, a problem with the system in the whole building. Whereas this particular one, the ward above and the ward below, wards below don't have any problems. So it's obviously not a problem with the the, the, the system itself. It's actually a user problem, uh, and this was actually caused by uh, misuse of the macerator in that particular ward. So we can highlight, and we're actually, by using this sort of report, so we can take it to people and say, look, you've, in a month, you've, you've managed to block that macerator 19 times. Um, and let's let's um, get some training here and actually teach people the right thing. And on occasions, we've found hairbrushes in, in that, uh, that particular macerator, which has caused the issues. So then we bring in the manufacturer, and has carried out training and new signage around the department. So it has been very beneficial for us on cases like this, where we can actually highlight particular areas of concern. Uh, then we have a, a report on the type of jobs that we're reporting. So this is basically whether they're urgent, routine, out of hours, or on emergency jobs. Then from this, we would look at 129 jobs, if that's out of hours in a month, um, and we only have one person on call. So this actually clearly points to us that we are generating a lot of out of hours work. And now we are from this, um, we would do a breakdown on those 129 jobs, find out how many are electrical, how many are mechanical, and it's guiding us now to actually change our on call pro process. Um, and we also, we've introduced mobile technology. Um, so all our operatives now use a mobile handheld device. It's quite easy, you can get an Android phone for about 50 quid these days. Um, all our operatives are equipped with a 4G card that we put data on, because it's easy for us to do that, um, the, as our Wi-Fi network is fairly poor. And we, we figure that the cost of a, a SIM to us is about 11 pounds a month, which is less than, less than an hourly rate. Um, so if, if by having that handheld, they can save an hour a month, then it pays for itself in effect. And it enables all the operatives to see see the jobs they've got, and it enables us that they can then sort that to group it by location. So if they're in a particular area, they can see if they've got jobs in that area. So they carry them all out at the same time, rather than as previously on a piece of paper, walk backwards and forwards to the workshop and waste a lot of time. So it helps uh, helps to speed up the process. And hopefully we'll be able to, in the future, once we get fully integrated, um, have more asset information on there and then be able to attach uh, manuals and drawings to them too. So if they go to a particular piece of mis, uh, misbehaving plant that they'd be able to have a manual with them on the handheld and actually find out, uh, hopefully get some information how to fix it there and then. The other uh, process we were looking at and, and to implement is our new works process. We have a, had a bizarre system where where, where people actually request a new shelf or put a whiteboard put up in the office and that would be for 25 pounds possibly to put up a whiteboard but we would actually go out to a contract to get a quote for them to put the whiteboard up then put that quote to the user who wanted it raise an order uh, and then send the order out to the contract a contractor comes and fits it does the invoice and then we put the invoice to the department and it can i think the the cost of that process was probably about 50 pounds in in time of, and the paperwork going round and round in circles for jobs that were probably only 20 30 pounds um which was absolutely ridiculous in, in this day and age so we tried to uh streamline the system when the next slide comes up if, so we've got instead of having four or five or six or eight steps to go through we should be able to get it down to about four steps where if somebody wants some new shelving or you know, notice boards put up, they want some signage, they will log the job straight onto our system, onto QFM, uh, with, with their budget code. And if it's below a particular amount, we'll just go ahead with it straight away onto our estate's budget code. And we'll just carry out the work there and then. And that monthly, well actually we'll be doing it three monthly, quarterly, we will just run a report of QFM with all the works we've carried out on different budget codes. And then we can just send that to finance and finance will just transfer from all the other budget codes back into WADS without having to go through a quotation process. So it speeds it up, uh, makes it a lot far more simple. Uh, so I think that's just about everything for me.
Uh, I'll hand you back now to Mike to summarise the webinar. Okay. Thank you very much, Edward. Um, it's really, really good to get a, an FM professional's perspective to see what uh, what these sorts of systems are providing you. Um, so if I could just summarise very quickly. Um, clearly, there's a lot to, get, to do to get this whole process right. But if you do, the benefits can be quite substantial. Uh, it's often quite amazing when we go through uh, the sort of cost benefit ROI calculators that we uh, we provide with customers, just how much they can potentially save. Um, and there was a, a, an example very recently where one of our clients who are an independent school, from their use of the system, they decided to bring their cleaning in-house. It was out with a contractor. Um, but the result of doing this actually led to them saving 250000 a year. And, you know, clearly they're, they're not a, a massive organisation like uh, like some of the hospitals and universities we, uh, we look after. So it was quite a quite significant cost, cost saving. Also, as discussed, it's vital to have established the high level goals at the outset and create a clearly defined business case. Um, one of the pitfalls is that many projects consider the business case as the last step prior to financial approval. But our recommendation would always be consider this as early as possible to ensure that your team are clearly targeting the, you know, the actual realizable benefits during the selection process, not necessarily just the things that make their lives easier. It's also going to be really important to establish a structured selection process that's clearly defined, realistic. And for some of you, and particularly those spending public money, it's probably important that that process is fully auditable as well. Um, make sure you plan the new system rollout as well. Um, you really want a clear plan to minimise your risks and anything that does look like a real, realistic risk that you've got the appropriate mitigations in place to, re, to reduce the impact of them. Part of the success will be to show that you've achieved the benefits you've targeted in your business case. So just as a, as a final point, you know, do think about what that business case is likely to show. So, for example, if your target in your business case is to complete 90 percent of your 95 percent of your PPM jobs on time, then it's absolutely vital to make sure that this KPI is easily reported out of your chosen system. So that's just an example. Anyway, I believe it's now time for us to think about winding up. Um, so I hope you found today's session useful and informative. The Good Practice Guide holds far more detail. So, um, you know, do log on to the Bifilm website and download it from the link uh, on the screen there at the moment. Um, that should give you uh, good access to it. There's some summary information just relating to some of the highlight figures uh, and facts that are in that guide. As we've also mentioned, Service Workgroup has some additional resources which can help you in your quest. So uh, by all means, come to our website, again at the link uh, up on the screen there, and uh, you can request our software advisory pack, our FM software advisory pack, that includes things like uh, how to build your business case and examples for doing that, an ROI calculator, so that's uh, how to actually calculate the return on investment, uh, a software functionality checklist, amongst other things. So to request that, you know, by all means follow that link or you can just phone or email us at info at swg.com. As Penny has also mentioned, um, the, the BIFM Technology Work Parties would like to hear more from you if you're interested in new trends or you've got some strong views in those areas. Okay, well, thank you all very much for your time. Um, I'm now going to hand you back to Annie uh, at BIFM to round off the webinar. So many thanks indeed. Hi, everybody. Um, and thank you very much to Mike, Penny, 
and Edward, um, fabulous presentations. I certainly learned a lot about FM software. Um, so I hope you found that useful. Can I just ask at this point, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask, if they could send them via the, the dashboard tab now, um, we'll pick them up. We'll ask the panel your questions. If we run out of time, then we will make sure that we get your questions answered after that, that point in time. And if I can just reiterate, the, the overall webinar is being recorded. So what we'll do in the next day or two, it will be available on our website to view. Um, alongside that, any outstanding questions, we'll, we'll put them up there with answers so that you can view those at the same time. Um, so yeah, please, please do that now. If you've got any further inquiries on anything at all um, on the BIFM website about BIFM in general, please do contact our membership department and that email address is membership at bifm.org.uk um, as it says there. Can I just, while we're waiting for more questions, let you know that the CPD number for today's webinar if you have an online CPD record is 4509. Um, all the FM professional standards are available on the website too. Also just a, just a little plug for our next webinar which is going to be on the 7th of December at 12 noon and that's on the subject of lawn working. So if you'd like to register for that again please go to the events page on our website. Okay, we've got um, a few questions coming in. I'm not, not quite sure who um, I should point these questions to. So please, Edward, Mike, Penny, um, pick up whoever you think is best placed to answer. Uh, the first question is, are there any industry benchmarks for appropriate costs of CAFM systems e.g. per user, per work request, etc. Mike, I'm not sure if that's one for you. Thank you, thank you, Annie. I say, I say slightly laughing because I'm not aware of any, but um, I, I think it would be a, a, a very interesting thing, which I'm, I think we could fairly easily pull together from a number of our users. So, um, I mean, if it's possible that whoever that is, um, or, or if, if you want general information fed back to you, Annie, if you uh, email that through to us, we'll um, see if we can pull together some statistics on that, because I think it's a, it's a very interesting point. All right, great. Thanks, Mike. Um, another question here, for the financial case ROI, how do you quantify the pound savings for some of the benefits that CAFM will bring to the organisation? Again, not sure if that's one for you, Mike, or whether that's one for you, Edward. Well, some of the savings are obviously uh, time-based on, on speeding up the process. I mean, previously, I mean, we had things like paper-based systems where we actually employed somebody effectively just to feed back work dockets. So, it, it, in the harsh reality is, without that, then that person becomes redundant and you could effectively save their salary. And um, that would have been around £15,000 a year. Uh, we didn't actually do that because they actually get reallocated to different tasks. But that's one of the things you have to look at. And the time saving from walking backwards and forwards to the workshop is one of the things as well. And beyond to group jobs, so somebody's always in the right location at the right time. They, they actually get a lot more work done. They're probably previously on paper based systems, maybe 75, 70, 75% productive. But now we'd probably say they're more, more like 80, 85% productive. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think it's a, it's a very good question to get because, of course, the answer to that is subjective. And we'll go and see one organisation who will consider that, um, you know, the reduction of administration will save them, uh, uh, as, as Edward said, one, one man person perhaps on a help desk or at least allow them to redeploy them. Um, for other people, it could be much greater. So it's not a, it's not a simple one to answer. But really important to have prompted that question because really that's what you need to have assessed on a business case when you start to say give me x thousand pounds to spend on a system 
So whilst my, my additional comments probably aren't that helpful, it's just reinforcing the importance of spending the time actually doing that, although it is a little subjective and, uh, and it's not the easiest part. Um, but you, you may actually find that the um, ROI calculator and uh, one or two other items in our advisory pack would help with that. Thanks, Mike. Um, we, we are getting the questions rolling in now. Um, I've got another one here. Um, again, I'm not sure this, whether this is uh, you, Mike, again, or Edward. Is there a tool to work out services charges when renting out office space? As this, this seems to be very difficult to agree a format. Uh, service charges on actually we do do service line reporting so having accurate drawings and then having information on occupiers does allow us to cross charge utilities to certain areas but it's something we're only just developing at the moment so it, it's quite early stages but it is something that we are um, increasingly carrying out okay thanks edward um if i just move on to this next question um i'm looking to install a CAFM system and need clarification on where to check the contractor's credibility and ability to deliver the requirements i need as they all say they can um yeah i mean i think that's a very good question that's a typical area where where people want these sorts of systems to help them and um, it, it's, you know, the bottom line is the systems aren't magic, but as long as you have within your system the facility to store the appropriate contractors' skills and capabilities, then you can have it so that those, um, that particular contractor is automatically allocated to the right work or a, a certain selection of uh, contractors with the appropriate skills are the only ones prompted, thus keeping you really focused on you know, allocating the right contractors and making it easy for your staff to allocate the right contractors to the right job. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, in fact, we've only got time for one more question. But as I say, we will get round to answering the questions and make sure that all your answers are put up on the website against the recording. Um, the, this final question then, are there any key stroke common challenges that an FM department should look at, including as part of the business case, i.e. to manage expectations? Again, that's that's probably looking at you, is it, Mike? Probably it is. Yes. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I mean, the, the bottom line is that you know that that's that there's a there's a, a lot of answers to that question, and it will vary industry by industry and organisation to organisation. But I think within the advisory pack and the good practice guide, there's a lot of uh, a lot of background and detail to help you you know to help guide you through those sorts of questions um i think it's it, it's almost too broad a question to give you a direct answer to now and it will depend very much on the sort of situation you're in what you're currently using what industry you're in and what your key challenges and problems are okay thanks mike um and and thanks again to the panel for answering those questions um keep keep the questions coming for as long as we're on air we will get to them we will get you answers um as i say the recording is available or will be available on the bifm website under the knowledge section within the next day or two um behind that we will get any other questions answered for you and they'll appear in the same place. But thank you, can I just say thank you for joining us today. Um, it has been a really useful webinar for myself. I hope you've enjoyed it too and taken a lot from it. And again, finally, can I say thanks to SWG for all the support, not just on the webinar today, but for the good practice guide. Um, and Thanks for joining and I hope to see you on a webinar soon. Thank you and goodbye.